Talmor, Sheshin Mugachi. Talmor is my home. My family have worked the land for generations. My gran says the island does not belong to us, but we belong to the island. And we must be ready for a great evil is coming. And death follows with it. Listen and subscribe to the latest season of Undertow, The Harrowing, a story glass production presented by Realm, available wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, I'm Alexis Ohanian. You may know me as one of the co-founders of Reddit, but more recently, a large part of my identity is being a father to my wonderful daughters. In my podcast, Business Dad, I hope to open the conversation about working parents a bit. You'll get to hear from a wide range of business dads, from Rain Wilson and Guy Raz to Todd Carmichael and Shane Battier, to find out how they balance being a dad with a successful career. Business Dad is available now, so be sure to listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Hello, world. Welcome back to Thanks for Coming In. I'm your host, Jillian Clare. Another week, another episode. If you're just tuning in for the first time, hello and welcome. Make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening to it. We love that. You could also rate it and give me reviews. I don't know. Whatever you want to do. I'm just saying. Maybe you, sh- maybe you should do that. I don't know. As a reminder, I like to tell you guys that uh, these interviews are recorded several weeks in advance, mostly because as a person who works in production, as an actor, producer, director, I never really know what my schedule is going to be like until I get the schedule. So I do several interviews several weeks in advance so that I have them and I know that I always have something to post for you guys. This conversation was recorded in early May, so prior to the murder of George Floyd and this incredible, heartbreaking, beautiful, and much-needed movement that is happening right now. If you have money that you can donate, you can go to blacklivesmatters.carrd.co, skip that Starbucks today, donate some money, $5, anything, it helps. And if you can't do that, there's also petitions There's places that you can email, politicians you can call. There are so many things that you can do right now, even if you're just staying at home. You don't necessarily have to be out there in the protests and on the front lines to be doing something useful during this time. Make sure you visit that link. It's going to be in the show notes. You can click it right now. And heck, you can send a couple emails while you're listening to the podcast. Today on the show, we have Martha Madison. You know her best from Days of Our Lives. A couple years ago, she also took a chance on me and agreed to be in my directorial debut, where she played a Southern mama who loves Paul Abdul. She was absolutely hysterical in it. And uh, she's just the best. And she's she does so much more than acting, too. She's a wonderful mother. Her daughter, Charlie, is literally going to be president one day. She's so smart. It's amazing. She's also a restaurateur. She has her hands in several, several different things. She's incredible. Here is my conversation with Martha Madison. Welcome, Martha. Hello. Hello. (laughs) How you doing, lady? Man, you know, day 62 in quarantine. I'm doing as best as could be expected. Yeah, I feel that. I feel that. My <laughs> my dogs are so sick of me. They're like, can you please go to work? Yeah, my dog is really sick of my daughter. So. <laughs> <laughs> She's torturing him. We actually just no. had our dog neutered doing all, during all of this. Um, oh, no. So he's... Uh, He's been recovering here uh, at the at my feet for the last few days, but um, oh, yeah. little baby, how old is he now? He's about s- almost eight months. Yeah, oh, he's, he's adorable, Vishla, and he is just the sweetest thing. You know, he was a crazy, crazy dog. They're all really high energy dogs this breed, mm-hmm. um, but he did start getting a little bit aggressive, so we did have to to go and and get him neutered and it was kind of funny because his balls like never dropped <laughs> so he never even I mean when we first got him I was like did they neuter him already like he oh they never came in so this dog had this weird syndrome where they are like still up in his abdomen so it was oh a pretty, my god a pretty 
pretty big surgery and and we were, you know, not sure how this was going to go. Like, is he's so high oh. energy? Is he going to keep his cone on? Is he going right. to rip stitches out? Man, this dog came back like totally zen. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's like, great. This is like a totally new dog. He's super chill. He's very affectionate. I don't know if it's the drugs or <laughs> what. It's probably partly drugs, partly the losing his manliness. Yeah, but he's such a he's such a cute dog. I love him. That's funny. That happened to me when I adopted my German Shepherd. I brought her home and I was told that she was spayed and I was like, cool, whatever. And then she started bleeding and I was like, oh my God, what is happening to this dog? So of course I take her into the vet and I'm like yeah no she spayed and so they're like oh she probably has blah 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 I don't know what terrible disease (laughs) yeah so then I spend like four hundred dollars on this dog I just adopted and then they're like um so here's the thing she's not spayed and I was like what (laughs) I did what now I just spent all this money for nothing okay great thank you so much well better than the horrible terrible thing that could have been making yes no it was (laughs) it was a good thing but you know that happened with my other dog recently too Tala she has like some sort of weird She's a husky and she has some sort of weird level that's like higher than it should be. So I went and I spent like all of this money on x-rays and all this craziness and nobody can figure it out. And they're just like, yeah, Mm. put her on some kidney food. That'll do it. I'm like, great. Sure. (laughs) It's like the level's still high. I'm like, this dog is so happy. She's chill. Like she doesn't act like anything's wrong with her. Right. It's all good. It's all good. (laughs) The dog's happy. We're happy. Exactly. As long as she's cool, I'm cool. (laughs) Good. Yeah. So I've known you. I was trying to figure this out before we started talking. I've known you for how many years now? Five? Six? Well, I think we've like known each other, known each other for probably five, six years. But I have known who you were forever since you were first on Days of Our Lives when you were like, what, 10? Yeah, I was a baby. So I knew who you were long before we knew each other. That's funny. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> wow you creepy stalker <laughs> I'm a creepy stalker no I just watched I watched days I was a big days of our lives fan and you were a great little Abby I just screamed a lot I mean that's basically what I did I screamed and I cried and I ran out of rooms that well was- that's that my what we do on soap operas. <laughs> that's true. At that's every, true. At every I age. <laughs> I didn't get to slap anyone, though. I was too young to slap somebody. I'm, I feel oh. like I missed out on something. Did you get slapped, though? I don't think so. I don't think I ever got slapped because that was like, you know, I was just guilt tripping my mom all the time. And I think I just made her feel like crap. Right. So I don't think anybody ever slapped me. You know, I think it's okay now for uh, for like all television to lose the slapping thing. Like, do we really need to slap each other? Nobody does that. (laughs) Yeah. The best slaps are always on um, on uh, friends when he would be on Days of Our Lives and somebody would get slapped. That was the best. Speaking of friends, I just finished watching the entire thing over again from start oh to finish. That's, it's the best. That was quarantine day one through 30. <laughs> <laughs> I it, love friends. It holds I cry- up. It really does. It's, it's so good. It's timeless. And, you know, honestly, they tell a lot of jokes that you can't really tell anymore. And yeah. I still find them funny. So <laughs> it was fun. Well, it's it was a different time and people weren't as, I don't know, politically correct as they are nowadays. Right. right. I love that show. I think that show is brilliant. I know some people out there think it's like a piece of crap, but it's one of my favorite TV shows ever made. It's not a piece of crap and it was way before its time and it totally, it stands the test of time. And honestly, it took me back to my, my twenties in New York. I was living in New York around the same time. And so it was very nostalgic as well. So you were living in New York. Is that when you were going to college for Uh, acting? No, I graduated from Texas A&M in 99. And then I Mm -hmm. moved to uh, New York to go to AMDA, the American Musical and Dramatic Academy, um, because I fancied myself uh, a Broadway career. I wanted to be a dancer. So I went and studied musical theater in New York for a couple of years and um, learned that I'm just not a strong enough singer to... Mm. To make it. And, you know, when you're when you're auditioning for musical theater, you have to sing first. And so I was a very, I would say, a a pretty experienced dancer. I never even got to the dance portion of any auditions because I I couldn't (laughs) sing my way into it. So I finally uh, threw in the towel um, and gave, you know, television a chance. And that seemed to be where more I had more success. So did you did you move immediately after AMDA over to Mm -hmm. L.A.? No, I lived in New York for four years and I was bartending and managing this really um, kind of cool 
restaurant nightclub thing. And, and, you know, I was getting home and and going to bed at like six o'clock in the morning, five, six days a week. And I was not auditioning at all because I was working so much. And I just, you know, I had a moment of clarity in the middle of Mm. the blizzard of 2003 and said, yeah, this just isn't working out. I got to get out of here. And my best friend at the time said, I'm out. I'm going to Los Angeles. I can't live in the snow anymore. And (laughs) I said, well, I'm coming with you. I've never been, but I'm coming with you. And we did. We moved out maybe a month later, you know, sight unseen kind of just. That's amazing. I I don't think I could do that. I don't think I could just move to a state that I've like barely been in or haven't been in. I don't think I could do it. I had just done it in New York. So I had only been to New York once. And I, I, you know, before I moved there, I'd gone for a few days to honestly to audition for the Nick City Dancers, which I did not make, although I got pretty close. But um, I, uh, yeah, I moved out there not really knowing anything or anyone at all. And so I wasn't like, I don't know if I could do it now. (laughs) But I think when you're that young and you don't, you know, it's just easy to adapt. And yeah. and so, and I had my friend going with me who we were going right. to live together. So I had more of that time than I did when I moved to New York and um, it turned out wow. great. What a, what a leap of faith you took there. Yeah. I used to do those kinds of things. <laughs> <laughs> Back when you could leave the house and you had yeah. hope. <laughs> Back when I had no responsibilities or any experiences to make me terrified. Yeah. So you came out to LA and then how long before you booked like your first big thing out here? Um, I, and by big thing, I mean, it could be like your first co-star because that's huge right. when you first moved to LA. Well, I was really lucky because I had screen tested for a couple different soaps while I was living in New York and I had a really good agent who referred me to an agent in LA when I moved. So hmm. I already had that lined up for me, which was such a big gift, right? I could hit huge. the ground running. And, um, I, my very first job I got in Los Angeles was like a three or four day arc on passions. <laughs> on, oh yeah. The soap opera passions, which came on right before days of our lives. And I was already a big days of our lives fan. I'd watched it my whole life. So this was like, I was getting close to being right. on days. You know what I mean? <laughs> You're like, I can smell it. Right. And it was such a weird job because if, if you've never watched the show, it's very supernatural. Yeah. I yeah. remember watching like a couple episodes because I've Eric, I think. Right. Then. So Eric Martzoff, who now plays my brother and my husband on To The Beat, <laughs> uh, was the star of the show. Brother, brother on Days of Our Lives, <laughs> husband and To The Beat. Right, right. Well, he, I think he was on the show at this point. Um, uh, but they had this guy playing like the villain character, but it was actually just like a hand model. And so what? it was like someone <laughs> off screen that was saying all the lines, but an, a- an actor, they were shooting his hands, like, you know, oh he's like God. hand <laughs> acting to this guy reading lines off stage. And I'm acting with the guy with the hands. <laughs> it was oh the God. most bizarre, like super weird. Um, that is the most awkward thing I've ever heard. <laughs> It was like, oh, it was no. just one of those moments like, booked it, you know, <laughs> like, here I am, booked this super weird thing and and now oh, I'm going to have to tell people about this, <laughs> you know, but it was a great Mom, experience. Look what I did. Yeah, I mean, I met, um, I met Galen Gehring um, yeah. and a couple other people that I, I ended up like, uh, Lindsay Hartley, who mm. actually ended up being my landlord years later. Um, oh, bizarre. Like just a weird, <laughs> it's just a weird, I don't know. It was fun. And then I booked uh, Days of Our Lives right after that. Wow. Yeah. So you just went bam, bam. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. I mean, it was just, you know, I, I felt the urge to move to LA. I knew that it was time to make that change. You know, I met my husband three days after I moved to Los Angeles and I booked what? my dream job nine months later. It was like, you know, it's a lesson in really listening to your intuition, I think. Wait, so you met you met your husband three days after being in LA. How crazy is that? And I didn't, let me tell you, I, part of my exit from New York was getting out of a very bad relationship. So <laughs> I was not at all interested in meeting uh, anybody to date. I really just wanted to go and have some fun and be by myself with my best friend and, you know. Wow. Go well, <laughs> I, I think uh, life had other things planned for you. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's just the way it all worked out. Wow. And then since days, you've gone on and off that show Mm -hmm. and you've done 
other things like Ladies of the Lake and mm-hmm. To the Beat, mm-hmm. which I'm so happy you were. Yes, in. yes. Um, and what was that one show? One Mississippi. One Mississippi. Really yeah, that was Tig Notaro's show. It was really kind of about her life. And I've known Tig since I was eight years old. We um, go way back. Wow. Uh, she was in school with my older sister, and so she used to hang out at our house all the time. And um, and so we, we all kind of lost touch after school and, um, I was working, I was bartending in New York and Allison, my older sister called me and said, Hey, Tig's in town. She's doing stand up." And I was like, Tig Notaro. And she's like, yeah. <laughs> and so we'll tell her to come and have a drink at my bar. Tell her where I am. And like 30 minutes later, Tig walks in and she's like, dude, I'm staying right across the street. And I was oh like, my that's gosh. so weird. So we totally reconnected and, um, you know, had a great time every time she would come into New York. And then I ended up moving to LA right at the same time she was moving to LA. And so Weird. she was one more person that I knew in LA when I moved here and we hung out a lot and just kept in touch. Oh yeah. That's a very fun friendship story. Yeah. I like that. She actually did stand up at my wedding. <laughs> no, she didn't. <laughs> she did. She oh did. my gosh. After we got married, I knew there was going to be this like hour period of time while I was getting, um, pictures taken. And, right. you know, my family is, is divorced like a hundred different ways. And so I was, I knew I needed to fill that hour gap. So nobody really had to talk to each other. <laughs> <laughs> and so I asked Tig to do stand up, and she, she obliged. It was hilarious. Oh my gosh. That's such a, that's such an innovative way to fill that time because yeah. that is such an awkward time at a wedding where yes. like, you know, the entire wedding party is off taking photos mm-hmm. and then they get back an hour hour and a half later and you're like y'all I'm hungry you're like what's going totally. on totally but I will say even though we went way back and this was her show when I saw that they were auditioning for this role I emailed her and I said hey you know I'd really like to audition for this role and she said all right but here's the deal like I can help you get the audition but I have nothing to do with casting so oh, wow. I just want you to know that if you don't get it it's not because I don't you know that we're not friends <laughs> it's like it's oh. all good totally get it <laughs> just give me the chance I got in and so when I got it I was like Tig thanks and she's like dude seriously I had nothing to do with it you booked that and I was like oh my god so oh, I don't know if so I sweet. totally believe her but I I, I took it <laughs> yeah don't argue with it take it and run yeah, yeah <laughs> totally Okay, so the whole point of this show is to tell a story either, you know, that ended badly or ended good. Oh, I have Um, so many of both. (laughs) Well, yes, I know. I know. All of us do. All of us actors have like a thousand of these stories of just, you know, absolute Mm -hmm. heartbreak or heartbreak that turned into greatness or Mm -hmm. something. So what is your your story? Well, I always like to tell the story about days of our lives because it's both it's heartbreak and excitement. I love it. Let's do it. All right. Well, when I moved out to Los Angeles in 2003, I only knew a couple of people. I had a brand new agent. I had no idea about anything in the industry, but I was uh, really close to booking a couple contract roles on soaps in New York. And so I knew that soaps was probably where I wanted to be hmm. because I was close. You know, so right. I was getting close. And Days of Our Lives was the show that I watched growing up. And it was one of the shows that shot in L.A. So mm-hmm. I had made up my mind. I was going to go for this whenever the opportunity wow. came around. It was just one of those things I decided I really, really wanted. Flash forward to I was a subscriber to Soap Opera Digest and I got a Soap Opera Digest (laughs) and on the front page it said, you know, like shocker, Kirsten Storms is exiting the role of Belle Black. And I was like, ooh, I could play that. I totally could play that. (laughs) You're like, I got this. This is mine. So I call my agent. I said, you've got to get me in for this role. And she said, okay, Mm -hmm. okay. And then she called me back. She said, yeah, they passed. They said, you're just too old. And I said, too no old? Way. And they said, yeah, you know, the actress that plays her now is much younger and the whole group, they're just younger. And and so I thought, you know, I was really disappointed and I slept right. on it. And the next day I got up and just thought, you know, no, I'm not taking <laughs> No. So I found, I dug through a bunch of old boxes and I found my headshot from like seven years earlier. <laughs> Okay. (laughs) I put that together with a resume and I hand wrote a note and I put it in the mail to Fran Bascom, God rest her soul, who was the casting director. 
And I thought, well, I'm just going to take this chance. And I mailed her a letter saying, I've been a fan of the show forever. Here's my headshot. I'm new to town. I know I can do this. Please, please, please see me. Mm. And lo and behold, about <laughs> two weeks later, I got a phone call directly from Fran Bascom's office. No saying, way. You can come in tomorrow at five o'clock. And tomorrow at five o'clock was Friday at five o'clock. I okay. was legitimately the very last person to audition for this role. Oh, my God. And I felt like the audition went great. I was super prepared, of course. <laughs> and she said, yes, come back in. You're going to go to producers next week. And I was like, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's happening. It's my happening. Dream is true. <laughs> right. But more than anything, I was just so excited. I get to go to the set of Days of Our Lives. Uh -oh. This is amazing. <laughs> so... I went in for the uh, producer session mm -hmm. and there were probably about 10 or 15 other girls there. And of course, you're sitting in this tiny room with all these other people who are yep. about to take your dream job and it's very <laughs> nerve wracking and everyone's sizing everyone up. And uh -huh. I got really nervous and I went into this producer session with the executive producers and the head of the network in their office. Mm. And I proceeded to give what I thought was the worst audition of my life. I could, you know, that feeling you just, you can yes. feel it yeah. sucking, but you can't stop the suck. Yeah. You know, yeah. you're just so far into sucking that you're like, I just got to get like, it over just, with. Can we just say the line so I can run away as fast <laughs> as possible? So it was one of those auditions and I just okay. felt terrible. I remember walking out to my car just in tears. Like I oh, can't no. believe I had this opportunity to te tee it up and I just blew it. Mm. As a podcast network, our first priority has always been audio and the stories we're able to share with you. But we also sell merch and organizing that was made both possible and easy with Shopify. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell and grow at every stage of your business, from the launch your online shop stage all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. They have an all-in-one e-commerce platform and in-person POS system, so wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. With the internet's best converting checkout, 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms, Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers. Shopify has allowed us to share something tangible with the podcast community we've built here, selling our beanies, sweatshirts, and mugs to fans of our shows without taking up too much time from all the other work we do to bring you even more great content. And it's not just us. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. Shopify is also the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Because businesses that grow grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash realm, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash R-E-A-L-M now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash realm. You can shop from anywhere doing pretty much anything. You might shop while working, eating, or even listening to this podcast. And however you shop, we all know and love the thrill of the hunt. But do you also know how to get the thrill of the best deals? Because Rakuten shoppers do. With Rakuten, they get the deals they love with the most savings and cash back. And you can get it too. Start getting cash back at your favorite stores like Sephora, Nike, and even Expedia if you're looking to get some travel in. And getting cash back doesn't mean you have to miss out on sales because those can just be stacked right on top. It's easy to use and based on a simple idea. Stores pay Rakuten for sending them shoppers and Rakuten shares the money with you as cash back through PayPal or check. Download the free Rakuten app and never miss a deal. Or go to Rakuten.com to start getting the most bang for your buck. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N.
Ow. So the next day, you know, and I've cried all night. I probably drank myself to sleep that night. Like we all, oh, yeah. all of us neurotic actors do to try to forget this terrible experience. <laughs> and the next day I got a phone call from my agent and they said, guess what? They loved you. You're going to a screen test. And I was like, what? What? <laughs> what? <laughs> well, and then I'm then I'm second guessing them. I'm like, God, maybe it's maybe it's bad. Like maybe I <laughs> shouldn't God. go work for people who think that that was good. Um, <laughs> and people so, are so blind, so blind. How? I mean, what did they see? Did they mistake me <laughs> with someone else? So anyway, I'm super excited. I'm going to go screen test with the actors. And I went and I was in the makeup room. I'll never forget this. And Peter uh-huh. Reckle walked in. He played Bo Brady. Mm-hmm. And I look over and he comes over, he puts his hand on my shoulder and he's like, hi, I'm Peter. Are you auditioning today? And I was like, uh, yeah, <laughs> yes, I, I'm reading for Bill. <laughs> like I was so nervous. Oh my <laughs> so, God, so dumb. Me. <laughs> so we go out, there's four of us, um, screen testing that day. Wow. And- there's Four? I feel like that's a lot of people to be screen testing. It's usually well, only two. There were four people testing that day, but I learned that day that we were the fourth test group. What? They had tested about 20 other girls that they had passed on. And so we were the last four. Oh and my so, God. right. I went out there and I feel like I nailed it. Right. Like I, yeah. I mean, I was not going to do what I did last time. And I walked off there going, nailed it, cried on cue, <laughs> hit my mark, got the light right, looked cute. Like <laughs> I was like, this is it. I'm getting it. And I remember walking off the stage and a couple of the makeup people were like, oh my God, you got, you got it. It's going to be yours. It's going to be yours. And so I'm walking out of there oh, going, man. oh my God, I just got this job. I just got, I'm going to get this job. And I go back to my restaurant job and I'm like, I can barely focus on my work because I'm so excited. Dropping plates everywhere. I can't (laughs) wait to like get the call. And the next day my agent called and she said, you know, sometimes the kiss of death in this business is wanting something too much. And I was like, what are you talking about? She said, they passed. They hired somebody else. And I just remember being crestfallen. I was just devastated and I just cried you, you know I just mm. I didn't know what else to do yeah because so, what do you do it's like there's there's so much in this business as an actor where you don't have control over something exactly and you get so close yeah and it's like you can already imagine all the ways in which your life is going to change you know, yeah and like how for the great better. it is to like right. be able to go to work every day and have these connections and these people that you work with right and but even not more have to worry about paying rent right even more not having to go to the crappy job that you have yes. that you don't want to go to every yes, day not you know? having to do that damn day job right and so um I, you know all those emotions came and at the time the show shot three weeks in advance and so I only had to wait three weeks to see who got it I didn't mm-hmm. know who got it mm-hmm. um um, and how good – and I just thought, well, they must be like the best Amazing. actress on the face, right. you know, because I felt really good about my audition. So I turn on the TV the day she's airing and I remember watching it going, okay, well, she's cute. She's petite. She has the same haircut as Kirsten uh-huh. did. Like she's definitely the right look. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm kind of like, I don't know if she's like the right essence. I, you know, but I also, you know, granted it's her first day. That would be really hard. It's a lot of lines, you know, I'm doing the whole thing, but I'm thinking to myself, I must really suck. (laughs) You know, I must have really sucked. (laughs) Cause that's what happens as actors. You see, you watch the people who book the roles that you want and then you go to yourself and you're like, man, you're awful, huh? Right. Right. (laughs) If I lost, you know, it wasn't anyway. So <laughs> I, I, I need to find a new like line of work was really how I felt yeah. about it yeah. and that I was never going to put myself in that situation again. I was ready to mm-hmm. like shut down shop. Mm-hmm. And the very next day, which was a Tuesday, my agent called me in the morning and she said, I just got a phone call from NBC and they want to know your sizes and they want to know if you can get to the studio today. And I said, for what? And she said, I don't know, but they want your sizes and they want you to get there as soon as you can. Maybe they wrote you in. Maybe there's something, you know, they're going to give you an arc or something, but get, you know, when can you get down there? And I said, well, I'll, I'm going to take a shower and look pretty and I'll be there in an hour. Um, Yeah. 
So I wow, got that is so like nerve wracking. Just wracking. getting that call and being like, okay, gotta go, bye. Right, but my one hundred percent expectation was I was going to walk in and they were going to be like, this day player didn't show up today, and you did right, right in your screen test. So here we're going to give you this biscuit, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I walk in and the stage manager is like, oh, you're Martha, come with me. And I was like, okay. And they walked me upstairs <laughs> to the executive producer's office, who was Steve Wyman at the time. And I walked in and he had this little clicker for the door, Uh like a remote control door. I walked in and he like remote control shut the door and I was, you know, it was just the two of us alone in this office. And I was thinking, oh "Oh my God, what is happening? (laughs) (laughs) And he said, so Martha, sometimes in this industry, we make mistakes. And oh my I God. said, you know, and I'm thinking, oh God, what did I do? Yeah. You're like, oh shit, <laughs> right. what happened? What, what did, did I do? I... And oh, he no. said, and, uh, you know, in this instance, we've made a mistake in casting and we would like to offer you the role of Belle Black. And I, I mean, my jaw, did I you wish, just fall to the floor. I honestly kind of blacked out for a minute. Like I don't really remember <laughs> exactly what I did, but I do remember I do remember him like reaching under his desk and pulling out two scripts and he hands me two scripts and he said, now I don't want you to panic, but I do want you to go down to hair and makeup and you are going to get your hair and makeup done. Your wardrobe will be in your dressing room and we have a dialogue coach coming to work with you because we're going to shoot these today. Oh my God. (laughs) I'm sorry. What? (laughs) He said, we're going to shoot these two shows this afternoon and it's going to be fine and you're going to do great. And I just looked at him and I said, thank you so much. I won't let you down. And I went downstairs and I got ready and I learned my lines and I went out to set and I shot these two shows and they were probably the worst work I've ever done in my life, but we got them out. (laughs) But you did it and it happened. And then I walked out and I called my mom and I said, I just booked this job and I've already shot my first two shows and I'm about to go to work to quit my job. And she just cried and I just cried. And it was like my dream just totally came true. It was a totally huge reversal from the weeks before and just such a lesson in how fickle the industry is and how how things can really change in the blink of an eye. So. I have chills. What a crazy story. Yeah, it was a crazy story and I love telling it because it's so crazy. <laughs> it's just what it's just one of those stories that you're you when you hear it, you're just like that does like that can't happen. It never you know? happens. But it happened, right? It Every, did. Everything's it did impossible happen. until it happens. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. And you're still playing Bell. Yes. So I played uh, Belle for about four years uh, consistently after that. And then um, after the writer strike, I was written out with several people. Um, mm-hmm. And my character went sailing around the world with her husband and daughter <laughs> for seven years. And oh my God. Uh, in 2015, when Josh Griffith became the head writer, they invited me back um, mm. on a full time kind of uh, contract and mm-hmm. uh, Belle had spent seven years, I guess, becoming an attorney on this boat. So she came back. <laughs> what kind of boat school is uh, that? I know she had law school on a boat and um, <laughs> came back and now is sort of the town lawyer, which is good. In a soap opera, yeah. you, you either want to be the lawyer or the doctor or the villain. Right. Like, because you, you got to always come back. Like, right. they're always going to need you. Someone right, is going right. to need you. So I've been back quite a, a few times since then and I'm, uh, I'm back now. Wow. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. That's crazy, man. That's, I mean, what a, because soaps are, you know, different in their own way because you can have a job in a soap opera for 20 years. I mean, it's mm-hmm. the most stable job in our industry. Yeah. I mean, I think it's the most, ref- it's the most similar to a nine to five job, right? Because it really, yeah. it does work on that schedule. It's more like 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. Mm-hmm. So you can actually have, a real family life and, and, you know, all of the things that that provides. The downside is, is that I think in our industry, there's such a stigma about being a soap opera actor that, well, if you work on soaps, you must be terrible. And the truth is that soap actors are some of the best actors I've ever worked with because you have to learn your lines, hit your mark, do the action. Um, Yeah. In one take. So everything you see on network television is the first and only take that we've ever done of that. And it's usually pretty good. (laughs) 
<laughs> exactly. I remember when I was on it, I messed up, I think, one time. And it was in the middle of this very long, drawn out speech that I had mm-hmm. in front of like half the cast. It was at somebody's house and I was yelling at my mom as per usual. <laughs> and I just like blanked halfway through and I just screamed out line and I just kept going and mm-hmm. then I started crying after and they're like what's wrong I was like I messed up and they're like but it's okay you you kept going I was like yeah but I don't mess up because when you're on a show like that you're just like right. you have to do it perfectly you right. have to it's a lot of pressure but I think it is. that um it but it's like a, it's like doing theater in a sense and that's mm-hmm. actually how I got days is because of my theater experience yeah the only reason I was on the show I think theater actors tend to do well in daytime because it's the schedule is the same the the expectation is the same that you know you don't get to screw it up yeah Um, I heard it said once that you know every everything you see on a soap is like an under-rehearsed opening night right uh, (laughs) oh my god who said that because that is brilliant I have to I have to look I can't remember but someone said it in an Emmy acceptance speech once like 20 years ago I remember watching it going that's that's exactly why it would be so exciting you know to do something like that um so yeah that's my pitch for hiring soap actors you know to all of the prime time and movie people out there because you're never going to get a more efficient first take uh it's true in soaps. and also you know it's not always easy to sell the, the material and if you yeah. can sell a scene about someone switching your embryo <laughs> with your best friend's baby you can sell anything it's so true <laughs> oh my god <laughs> that is such a good point I remember after I had left days because they aged my character up over summer camp by like six years of, or some crap like mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. but um I remember watching it I think like one or two times after I had left and it being that my dad was actually alive and that they were all living on right. an island and like Deidre was like <laughs> yes possessed or something mm-hmm. and I was like what in the hell was that yeah what that, that was, was is ratings gold. <laughs> it was. It was ratings gold. It's just so bizarre because I went yeah. I think I went to like 12 funerals on that show or something. And then they were all alive. And I'm just sitting there like, so I cried for nothing. Right. <laughs> all those times I cried for nothing. Damn it. <laughs> That's another good skill we learn in soaps is we can yeah, cry. Lots of crying. On cue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lots of crying. Yeah. I, I think I had only auditioned even once for for days with Fran. Mm-hmm. I don't think I even went to a second session really? so it was such a quick turnaround and they had to do it super quickly because they just wanted basically somebody who could cry on cue because yeah. they knew that they were killing jack oh gosh how many so, times have they killed jack i think he's died like 20 times i Truly. think he really is the most killed character on days yeah. of our lives but but i will say the one thing that i never understood is that when i was on it and my dad died we met the lady whose husband got Jack's eyes. So I'm like, whose eyes did this man have if they were not Jack's eyes? Oh, my God. That happened so sort great. of to me on, on a show that I did. They get my character like drowned in the ocean. And then they finally find her remains like in the ocean. But they use her <laughs> liver as, for, as a liver donor. I'm like, I'm pretty How? sure the liver is going to go with her. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty just, sure. Just slightly. Oh, man. Soaps are fun. I love how like absolutely wild they are and that people just like just believe it because that's well, just the world that's built. Right. You know, I think that's that what you the, expect from it. The point of soap operas is to suspend reality for right. a little while. And mm-hmm. so it's allowed to be a little cray cray because the point <laughs> is we want to get away from our real life for an hour in it's the afternoon. True. That's what it's supposed to be. So um, it's like, um, I always think the crazier, the better, and certainly the more yeah. fun for us. You know? Way more fun, way more fun. It goes all the way back to friends at the start of this episode when he got Susan Sarandon's brain in Days of Our Lives yes. and he came back to it. And you're just like, this is brilliant and this should happen on Days. Why I, haven't you done this? I know. <laughs> I know. I want to be, I want to be Sammy's brain. I want to have Sammy's brain. Let's oh, have Sammy. Sammy. For a little while. That would be that would be a fun little switcheroo. <laughs> I well, like that. Yeah. Sammy got to be Stan for a while. I don't know if you remember that, but Who's Stan. 
When when Ali Sweeney was having a baby for, for uh-huh. her maternity leave, they hired a guy to play her, and she was like no. in disguise as a guy who was in the military, <laughs> and his name was Stan. Oh my god! They made <laughs> Sammy go Mulan. Like this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and it totally worked <laughs> how did I not know about this this is brilliant yeah but this is why uh, working on soaps is fun and it's also yeah. you know you laugh a lot because what choice yeah. do you have <laughs> I yeah I mean if there's one thing I do remember other than just like all the crying and funerals it's that it was fun and I had a blast and I yes. had the best set teacher ever on that show she taught me yoga when I was 10 and I thought that was cool as hell Bobby Ross Yes, Bobby. <laughs> she was the best. I she loved her. her. She's still there. Actually, I had because Kirsten had left, I think, right before I went on or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and maybe. I got I got Kirsten's. She left me her like day bed because I got her dressing room when she left. Oh, how interesting. Yeah, hmm. it, was, it was nice. It was a great day bed. And I remember for Christmas that year, we all got TVs that had um the VCR player. In it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, this is so cool. It was cool because you could actually record the feed. So you could yeah. watch yourself back when you were done yeah. and be like, yeah, that one's okay. It's going to make it. Yeah. My mom <laughs> would like sit in the dressing room and watch me what I was doing and I'd go off and do my thing and come back. I also remember the hot chocolate. I loved it. For whatever reason, they had great hot chocolate. I've oh, never had hot chocolate. That was before my time. Right uh, now, they just have like rusty coffee and, <laughs> and half eaten bagels. So, cra- Crafty's taken a turn for the worst. Like, Maybe it was Bobby. Maybe Bobby just <laughs> made sure that I had hot chocolate. I don't know. Who knows? Oh, man. I That's so much fun. I think I want to go back and just visit and see everybody. I yeah. bet they'd be like, who are you? <laughs> no, no. It's like once you're once you've been on the show, you are part of the, the legacy or part of the history. Hey, I'm in the Days of Our Lives 50th anniversary book. Dang it. There you go. <laughs> there you go. That's actually one of my biggest achievements. I'm kidding. Uh, it's important. It's, you know, it's Days of Our really Lives cool. is actually in the Television Hall of Fame. And is it really? Is, is going on its 55, 55th year of production. And really. It's pretty remarkable when you think about it. Yes, it is. And so let's give props where props are due. Props, props, props to our family at Days. Um. That was fun. Wow. What a crazy, crazy story. What a wild ride you went on. <laughs> wow. Um, I also, before I let you go mm-hmm. back to your quarantined life, okay. <laughs> I wanted to um, have you talk about your mom a little bit because you do a lot of work mm-hmm. with MS and I just wanted to mm-hmm. let you you know, speak on that sure. for a moment. Well, uh, you know, I'll talk about that and also the the FTD association. So yes. the MS, my mom is one of these uh, very unlucky people who has had two terrible diseases. Um, she had relapsing remitting MS, um, and uh, which kind of masked the symptoms and di- uh, ultimate mm-hmm. diagnosis of the second disease, which is called frontotemporal dementia, which is actually the most common form of dementia in people under 60 years old. So, um, it's a, it's a disease of the frontal lobe. Uh, it really, um, st- starts to destroy speech and behavior. Mm-hmm. And, um, so basically, you know, my mom was acting crazy and saying weird stuff for a long time until we figured out what was wrong <laughs> with her. Um, and it's been a very slow and, and terrible progression, but, um, yeah. We do a lot of work with the uh, AFTD, and I'm also a national ambassador for the MS Society, mm-hmm. um, trying to raise awareness and money for both foundations. And um, I am now training for my third marathon, which Woo-hoo! will be in support of the AFTD, um, the Association of Frontotemporal Dementia. And you can check that out at AFTD.org. Sorry, the AFTD.org. Thank you for sharing that. I just yes. wanted to get people aware a little bit because I know that you're always posting about it and it's just so amazing to see you so involved in that community and doing what you're doing I think it's really inspiring so thank you I like you you're cool I like you too (laughs) and um where can everybody find you on social media um on social media on Instagram and Twitter I'm at Marth 
27, Marth, not Martha, because that's what my mom calls me. Um, And um, we're also doing a new podcast called While We Were Waiting, which is uh, uses the restaurant industry as sort of a jump off point. For those who don't know me, my husband and I own restaurants and I'm also um, a hospitality recruiter. And so we talk a lot about how this shutdown is affecting the industry. And we also talk to a lot of great operators and chefs. um, And we tell some fun stories about the restaurant industry. So you can check that out at while we were waiting podcast.com. A woman of many talents. I many, love to see many it. Many hats. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much for coming on. It's always a pleasure talking to you. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's always good to catch up and hopefully we'll all be out of quarantine soon. Yeah. And then we can make more movies. Yay. Movies. <laughs> Movie time. <laughs> I'm not going to audition though. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. You don't have to audition. But I mean, I don't know. Maybe you could do like a, a sock puppet audition with Charlie or something. Yeah. Let's teach her to audition. I would love to teach Charlie to audition. Let's she break would her in a little. <laughs> she would kick ass. She has such sass. You know, that child would be like a rock star. Yeah. She's like, Mommy, I think on Mondays, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, I'm going to be a surgeon. But then on Thursdays, <laughs> Fridays and Saturdays, I'm going to be an actor. What do you think? <laughs> I'm like, if anyone can do it, kiddo, it's you. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. What a gem. I love it. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you so much. I will talk to you soon. Thanks, Jillian. Take care. Bye. Thanks again to Martha Madison for coming on the show and sharing her wild roller coaster of a story. Next week on the show, we have JT Neal from Bless This Mess. Make sure to subscribe to the show wherever you're listening to it now. You can also follow us on social media. Links are in the show notes. Tell your mom, tell your friend, tell your dad, tell your dog, tell your parrot. I don't care who you tell, but tell somebody about the show. And as always, thanks for coming in. The thing that I fought tooth and nail to bring my son into is Dungeons and Dragons. That is the ultimate solution to parenthood. I'm Alexis Ohanian. In my podcast, Business Dad, I'm hoping to open up the conversation about balancing careers and family. I talked to Rain Wilson. I wanted to learn more about Rain's advice to play D&D with your kids. Business Dad is available now, so be sure to listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you.